ladies and gentlemen, this is TVP World. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and oh, welcome aboard the Eastern Express. On this episode, we're taking a closer look at one of the most quiet and sometimes overlooked positions in the battlefield, the snipers on the front lines of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. They spend hours, even days, in concealment, awaiting the precise moment to make a shot that could shift the balance of battle. In Ukraine, these elite shooters play a crucial role and their stories are both gripping and horroring. As you will see today, it is not just Ukrainians who gear up to withstand the Russian onslaught. Let's delve into the trenches and uncover what it truly means to be on the front line. Our latest report reveals more. In the ongoing conflict between Ukraine and Russia, Ukrainian snipers have emerged as very important assets in the country's arsenal. But becoming a sniper is not that easy. It takes a year of intense training to become one. The sniper school is engaged in preliminary selection, selection of cadets and providing basic skills. It is an introduction to the profession. After that, it sends the sniper to a combat brigade. One renowned unit is the Ghosts of Bakhmut. They became famous after spending months battling Russian forces around the city. I came on the first day of the war and immediately joined to these special forces. I took part in battles in Ostomel and Bucha. After that, they were looking for people that had some understanding of military service to join a sniper group. These highly skilled marksmen are not only targeting Russian soldiers, but also disrupting supply lines and communications. They claim to have killed more than 500 Russian troops during the Battle of Bakhmut alone. We destroy everyone, regardless of military rank. There is no difference. Right now, we destroy all the infantry there is. The snipers operate in small mobile units, often working under challenging conditions to maintain their positions and execute their missions. But Ukrainian troops have to be cautious, as on the other side of the front line, Russian snipers also lie in wait. And now, let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. With their lives perpetually at risk, these marksmen are redefining the strategy of modern warfare. Visualize a battlefield ravaged by months of incessant fighting. The land pocketed with artillery craters and the buildings all around you resemble a post-apocalyptic view from a video game. Now, this is the Ukrainian frontline, where every choice can mean the difference between life and death. Under these extreme conditions, Ukrainian snipers carry out some of the most critical missions. Just picture you're peering through a sniper scope, your target is over a mile away, and you have mere seconds from pulling the trigger to impact. Now, this is the reality for the snipers fighting in the Ukrainian army. So, what does it take to be a sniper in such a high-stakes environment? Now, this demands exceptional skill, immense patience, and unwavering nerves. These soldiers must consider various factors such as wind speed, bullet trajectory, and even the Earth's rotation. They rely heavily on their spotters for real-time data, ensuring each shot is as precise as possible. This is where prior civilians and reconnaissance meet. This involves more than just pulling a trigger on a longer rifle. It's a complex process requiring intense focus and precision. Snipers often operate close to enemy lines, continually risking detection and compromising their position. This constant threat forces them to continuously adapt to their tactics. Adaptability and movements are crucial for staying ahead of the enemy and remaining undetected. The pressure to make every shot count, the isolation, and the omnipresent danger all contribute to the mental strain. These highly skilled professionals must manage their mental health under extreme conditions, bringing the knowledge that each shot could end a life. It's a heavy burden carried with remarkable resilience, but why are snipers so indispensable in this conflict? While in a war dominated by heavy artillery, tanks, drones, and missiles, sniper offers a unique advantage. They serve as the unseen eyes and years on the battlefield, capable of gathering intelligence and eliminating high-value targets discreetly. Snipers exemplify the complexity of warfare as they navigate its harsh realities. Their often overlooked role is essential for the success of numerous military operations. That's why today we are acknowledging the pivotal role snipers play on the Ukrainian front line. Stay tuned for a conversation I had with one of the individuals serving in the front lines under anonymity. 
And now here to shed more light on the issue, we have Sig, a Canadian sniper fighting on the side of Ukraine. Hello, sir, and welcome to Eastern Crest. Hello. So I'm hoping to get a little bit of your story here. What's the incentive? What motivated you to go to the front line and fight in Ukraine of all places? Well, um, let me introduce myself first. Um, I am Canadian, but I was born in a former Soviet Union, not in Ukraine and not, um, not in Russia. So I immigrated to Canada uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, I'm ex-military, ex-law enforcement. So prior to the revolution in Ukraine in 2013, I did not pay much attention to what is going on in Ukraine because I don't have any connection whatsoever to Ukraine. Um, and when the revolution happened, that was actually uh, kind of shock for me, uh, seeing people are capable overthrowing their uh, tyrannical corrupt government. So I stayed, I start paying more attention. And then uh, in 2015, I was trying to join one of the uh, uh, one of the three brigades, or how they call it themselves, the volunteer brigades. Unfortunately, I couldn't. So, long story short, um, in 2018, I came to Ukraine uh, by the first time. Uh, worked as uh, worked as instructor most of the time as instructor. Um, at that time, I could only stay uh, for 90 days in Ukraine. So I did multiple trips from uh, 2018 up to uh, 2021. And then when uh, the full-scale Russian aggression uh, began, uh, I moved to Ukraine by the end of February and beginning March um, was already involved in uh, in the fightings around Kiev. Then um, I was also an instructor in a different brigades and ended up training people, uh, uh, training snipers in uh, special operation force SSO uh, for four months. And then uh, by the end of September 22, uh, my guys and myself, we were moved to towards Bakhmut area, uh, where I stayed for pretty much by the end of, to the end of December. Uh, then I got injured. I had to go back to Canada for recovery. And now I'm back. I'm, uh, I joined the Ukrainian National Guard, uh, one of the brigade in uh, Special Operations Sniper Unit as a sniper. All right, like you mentioned there, uh, being able to see an authoritarian regime being overthrown is an inspiration, perhaps. And I think a lot of people after this war might take you guys as inspiration to kind of fight their own fight. And I think it's very important to kind of carry that forward. And while well, knowing that, you know, there are our predecessors that gave us the freedom that uh, we so much kind of cherish right now. In the meantime, I'm also wondering if you can tell us, like, when you're out there in the front, what are some of the things that you missed? most back home uh sorry what do you mean what do i miss back home mm -hmm. being in canada yeah that what do you mean uh first thing camaraderie i really missed my uh, brothers on arms and uh i missed the action hmm. and well it's not very often that we get to talk to somebody who actually served and being in the front. And I think it's very interesting for me where, uh, you know, usually when we look at uh, snipers through the scope of uh, movies or public uh, 
depiction, there's usually some misconceptions. Can you tell us whether or not these depictions are actually accurate? Or are there any uh, kind of misconception, you know, people see in the movie, which you can point out and say, you know what, that's actually not true? Well, I would say 90% what uh, what people uh, see in the movies is not true. Uh, snipers have specific vibe of being uh, uh, superheroes. Uh, we are not. We are actually biggest coverts uh, on the front line. Our job is not to be heroes. Our job is to kind of get in, uh, do what we have to do, and get the hell out. Um, so uh, many people think snipers can uh, create a wonder. Uh, it, we are not. We're very well trained, but we are still people. Um, so that's why every time I see some movies about snipers, they're, they're not very, very precise, I would say. Sir, you are selling yourself short. I know that being on the front line, of course, does come with a lot of risk. You mentioned earlier that there was an injury where you have to recover from. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that is that did that occur uh, during your time on the front lines? Uh, correct. I was in uh, near Solidar, uh, on the second floor of half destroyed building when uh, Russians. Uh, they probably spotted me because they concentrated uh, specifically uh, on this specific place and we got uh, incoming mortars and incoming artillery. I had to run downstairs pretty fast and um, uh, I basically felt and I injured my, uh, my right foot. Uh, first thing I thought I broke it, but that was just... Uh, uh, I tore them, uh, the ligaments. Um, so for the next couple of days, I basically was limping around uh, from one position to another one. And when we had to finally, uh, we had uh, the order to uh, to move out to another position, I had to use a piece of metal bar as a crouch because I could, I could barely move. That was funny because people were just laughing. They said, oh, uh, you guys are supposed to be a elite force and now you have somebody limping, uh, limping around. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you're still very much respected after that. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about your time serving in Ukraine? Uh, is there any issue with the language barrier or coordination issues because you're from Canada? Or do you think uh, most of the time have, have experienced things being like more seamless and cooperative? Well, uh, I don't have any issues because I uh, speak Ukrainian and I speak Russian. So the language barrier is not an issue, but yes, I had an issue um, uh, with one uh, before I joined uh, SOF. I was an instructor in a different brigade, and um, the brand new brigade I supposed to train snipers, and uh, I have a big issue. There. With the battalion commander and uh, commanding officers, so I finally left after over a month because I did not want to be responsible uh, for their incompetency. Uh, unfortunately, um, the battalion right now does not exist anymore because most of those guys are uh, TIA or heavy ranger. Uh, yes, this is a big issue uh, I see even now uh, with uh, good training. I mean, their commanding officers, they I would not say most of them, but many of them just uh, lacking their knowledge, lacking the experience and lacking the willingness to learn something new. Hmm. Wow, that, yes. that seems like that seems like a very difficult time over there. Uh, quick question. 
when you're training these kind of recruits, are there any special sort of characteristic you're looking for? Is there something that would give you a sign that, okay, this guy will be a good uh, sniper, or maybe this guy is just not cut for it? Okay, so um, Ukrainian military is very different from one unit to another one. Um, it, it's hard to describe. I was trying to implement some uh, tests I personally undergo in a sniper school, and they don't have time for that. Oh. In a special force, in a SOF, the situation is different. They are trying to hire people with uh, to hire people with uh, uh, the higher education and uh, the knowledge. And it very depends on the commander. If the commander of the unit understands the needs, uh, the needs and the issues, then everything will be fine. Uh, I can speak up. I can highly speak up of my previous commander, nicknamed Diver. He was a very knowledgeable, very intelligent commander. That's why our unit was so successful. Uh, yes, we have, we had some issues with ammo and, and guns at the, uh, at the beginning, but again, uh, everything is possible. Everything is manageable when the commander is good. Unfortunately, in many units, this is not, this is not a thing. This is not a case. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks for shedding light on this issue. I mean, you, I think you brought up a very important point that there's really not a lot of time for Ukrainians to go from being recruited and to be uh, having to be on the front line. So when that's a situation like that happen, when you have to kind of bring a group of soldiers maybe up to speed and you know that they really have a very limited amount of time, what are some of the things that you feel like is most important that you have to drill into their heads, like the least bare minimum before they have to kind of pick up a gun and start going to the front? Okay. Um, if somebody decided to be a sniper, uh, the first thing I, I look at his his IQ must be more than higher than average. Hmm. Uh, and the motivation, he must be highly motivated and intelligent. If those two things are present, I can train uh, those people successfully. But if they just sign up as a snipers, okay, it's like, uh, here, we have a position as a sniper, you are the sniper. And the guy had no idea uh, prior to that. And he is bad with um, simple mathematics, simple logics. Um, it doesn't matter how much time I will spend uh, training him. It's, it's It will never happen. He is not going to be a sniper. Um, yeah. Yeah, it does sound like there's a lot of intricacy into this. And thank you so much for giving us a little brief peek into your line of work and helping us understand more of the situation in the front. So really appreciate it. Thanks for being with us on X Express. Thank you. And that was our exclusive conversation with the sniper fighting at the front. Now we're moving on to the Eastern News Slash, a series of all the other stories from the East that you don't want to miss. Despite Russian attacks on its energy infrastructure, Ukraine is on a pathway to secure its gas needs for the upcoming winter season. The country's gas companies are storing vast amounts of gas and increasing its production. Nafto Gas, Ukraine's state-owned oil and gas company, has successfully accumulated 10 billion cubic meters of gas reserves, reaching 76% of its target for the upcoming winter season. The company aims to store 13 billion cubic meters by November, providing a crucial safety cushion beyond expected consumption. Despite facing challenges, namely Russian attacks on energy infrastructure, Naftogaz has continued to build its reserves. The company reported that Ukraine used 6.7 billion cubic meters of gas during the last heating season, relying solely on domestically produced gas for the first time in its history. Naftogaz CEO Oleksiy Chernysov 
highlighted the significance of this achievement, emphasizing the company's resilience and commitment to energy independence. Poland's Deputy Foreign Minister Andrzej Szajna outlined conditions for normalizing relations with Belarus. He emphasized that, among other things, Poland was seriously considering halting the transport of goods through Belarus, a move that would have significant economic implications for both countries. For relations between Warsaw and Minsk to normalize, Poland's Deputy Foreign Minister Andrzej Szejna says Belarus must stop its hybrid attacks on the Polish border. It must also extradite the individual responsible for the murder of a Polish soldier and release Polish citizens currently imprisoned in Belarus. Szejna has also noted that Belarus's close ties with Russia, which is hostile to Ukraine, limit the possibilities for cooperation. Currently, only one border crossing remains open for road freight traffic between Poland and Belarus, and one for passenger traffic, heavily restricted by EU sanctions. The president of the Belarusian Supreme Court, Valentin Sukala, announced the possibility of releasing more political prisoners under certain conditions. Earlier in July, Belarus released 18 individuals convicted in political trials. The decision to release them has received mixed reactions. Human rights activists point out that some prisoners have declined the opportunity for release, fearing for their safety. Hungary and Slovakia have asked the European Commission to mediate with Ukraine after Kyiv hardened sanctions against Luke Oil, Russia's second largest oil producer. Ukraine tightened sanctions against the company back in June, effectively halting oil supplies through its territory. Hungary and Slovakia have requested the European Commission to mediate consultations with Ukraine following Kyiv's recent sanctions against Lukol, Russia's second largest oil producer. The sanctions, which were tightened in June 2024, have halted Lukol's oil transit through Ukraine, causing significant supply disruptions for both countries. Hungarian Foreign Minister Peter Sciardo has emphasized that the Commission has three days to execute the request, after which Hungary will bring the issue to court. Sciardo labeled Ukraine's decision as unacceptable and a violation of the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. Ukraine, however, has yet to respond to the request for consultations. The sanctions have particularly impacted Hungary, which relies on Russia for 70% of its oil supply. With local accounting for half of that volume, the restrictions have led to shortages in Budapest. And that's all in this episode of Eastern Express. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TVB World.